Hi, and welcome to EnviroCenter's Green Room. Meet the people on the front lines of climate action and find out what keeps them up at night. I'm Mandy, and this week we're joined by Emma Gammons, Communications Lead Futures Lab. Welcome, Emma. We ask all of our guests to bring one environmental fact to share. What have you brought with you today? Hey, Mandy. Thanks so much for having me. Um, the fact that I wanted to bring today is more of a sort of a general broad fact, but what I wanted to bring to light, um, and I'll explore this concept a little bit more as we talk uh, today, it's around drawing on our existing assets and resources. So, you know, a lot of the time when we think about energy transition, we sometimes think about needing to transition away from everything that's in our current system, away from everything that's sort of recognizable to us. Uh, but there are actually a ton of opportunities to turn things that right now might appear to be environmental uh, liabilities into things that are actually environmental solutions. So, for example, a couple areas where the Energy Futures Lab has been really focused is that looking, uh, is that looking at things like uh, repurposing oil and gas wells to be used for geothermal projects or lithium extraction. Another great example is around bitumen, a resource that's found in the oil sands. So. Um, bitumen, for example, can be used to turn thing can be used to uh, create products like carbon fiber. Very cool. Thank you. Um, right into the heart of it, then, what climate problem keeps you up at night? So it's interesting because I think on the one hand, there's the fairly straightforward answer around greenhouse gas emissions, the repercussions with global warming. Um, but that's not really what keeps me up at night, and that's not because I don't see that as a significant part of the climate change challenge. Um, it's certainly a very pressing issue, um, but I do genuinely believe that there's a lot of good reason to feel hopeful, a lot of good reason to feel optimistic, um, and that we have a lot of solutions in sight. But if I were to name two things that I tend to dwell on a little bit more frequently, I would say that firstly, the first one is more around um, sort of human behavior, human nature. So. I do believe that humans are really innovative, that we're adaptable by nature, um, but that we can also be really resistant, really stubborn and fear motivated. Um, and so when we're dealing with the complexities associated with something like climate change or energy transition, this can evoke a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty for people uh, and lead to a lot of heightened polarization. Um, and so this is actually one of the reasons that the Energy Futures Lab was created was to address growing polarization on energy topics in Alberta, um, and we try to focus on bring we try to focus on bringing people into a place we call the radical middle, so a place for people to really engage in more constructive and solutions oriented conversations. And then the second piece that I tend to dwell on a little bit more is around the harder to abate sectors. So these being really energy intensive industries like aviation, steel and iron, or cement and concrete industries. And while there's a, a lot of effort going into figuring out how to decarbonize or lower emissions for these industries, um, there's you know energy sources like hydrogen being one potential solution. It's still a pretty tricky challenge. So I do think about that quite a bit. It's very good to know. I love how everyone's answer to this question differs greatly. It's great to hear everyone's perspectives. Um, next question is, um, what is the solution? I mean, I think the key consideration here is that the best solution will probably involve a whole host of different solutions. So thinking about, you know, climate change and energy, I often think about how different solutions can complement one another. So, you know, with the lab, a big part of what makes our work so special is the emphasis on systems thinking. So, you know, the acknowledgement that, you know, change to one part of the system can have a ripple effect and that we really need to come at the system from different angles, employ different solutions, um, which can very likely be complementary, but might also be targeting different challenges. So, you know, for example, carbon capture utilization and storage is set to play a pretty big role when it comes to the global energy transition, but we're not just going to look at CCUS and say, okay, we've spent some time focusing on this and now we're done, it's time to move on. You know, we're going to look at CCUS and, or we're going to look at wind energy and, and how all of these different solutions can come and play together in the same space to address uh, the same challenge. Um, and so I had brought up, you know, at the very beginning, the ability to look at existing assets and resources as well. And so there are a lot of solutions that are even 
right in front of us that we can get creative about um, and kind of like repurpose oil and gas wells for geothermal or solar sites um, as one example. Thank you. Um, so you've spoken about the solutions. I love that you indicate that it's obviously a multi-layered approach. It's very complex. There's not just one single solution. So what do you think is in the way? I mean, yeah, I mentioned the polarization. I think that's definitely one of the big hurdles for us to kind of keep leaping over. Um, but I also think that there is a really big need for collaboration. So in the lab, we focus on bringing people together from across different sectors, different levels of government, academia, artists, you know, oil and gas experts, people from clean tech and a lot of other industries as well. Um, and I really like to think that, you know, this kind of cross pollination can become central to addressing climate change and, and energy transition. Um, you know, it's, it's not siloing our work, there's an interconnectedness between all of these different solutions. So being able to see that technology and new policy and education all sort of weaves together uh, can definitely help us move forward together. So with those in mind, how can people help? I love this question because I think uh, people play such an important role in enabling change. So for starters, um, I think it's worth mentioning that different people will have different roles to play depending on their expertise, depending on their passions. Um, but let's just say that we're talking about the general public, you know, maybe people who aren't working in fields focused on climate change or energy every day. Um, I think the role of education really can't be overemphasized. Um, and I say this because, you know, at the end of the day, what people want and what people advocate for does have an impact. So it's really important for us to understand that what we're, you know, advocating for, how these different ideas, technologies, or policies, how they will impact what is a really complex system. Um, and then for people who, you know, maybe do work in these fields or people who share a strong understanding of the system, I think there's also a critical need for collaboration that I kind of spoke to earlier. So no one person or organization or even one sector is going to be able to single-handedly address energy transition. So I think being able to see the opportunity in cross-pollination to share ideas, to share questions, technologies, um, is a really big way that people can help. I love that. Collaboration. Collaboration is the key across all of this. Um, so finally, the last question, what is the good future? I mean, for me personally, um, as well as the Energy Futures Lab vision, there's, you know, net zero by 2050, um, or hopefully by 2050. But what I really hope to see is also move away from putting all of our eggs in one basket. I'd really love to see a future where we've got um, resilient and robust systems, so a whole bunch of different energy types, you know, in the mix together, different players at the table. Um, and then another piece as well, and we've heard a lot about this, especially in the last year, is around a just transition. Um, and so I'd love to see these commitments to social justice carried forward. And I just bring that up in this conversation because there's so much overlap between social issues, climate change, energy transition, um, and being able to move into a future where energy is not just affordable, but it's also accessible and reliable for everybody is an absolute must in my mind. Thank you, Emma, and thank you for joining us today. You can find out more about our work and sign up for our newsletter at envirocenter.ca, and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube.